Hi, I am Don Berg. This is the second in the Attitude Basics series. What's educational? The dominant answer to that question is whatever the state declares to be educational via the standards they adopt under the thoughtful advice of legions of experts. The experts can presumably tell us tell whether various activities, information, and materials have educational value or not. For instance, if you look at the standards in all the English-speaking countries of the world, I would guess that you would find that reading Shakespeare is considered an obligatory educational activity in all those countries. I agree that reading Shakespeare might be educational, but what would make it so? One of the key assumptions behind adopting it as a universal standard activity that all students must engage in is that the expert consensus must mean there is something objectively educational about it. Simply by reading Shakespeare, a person is better educated than they were before, right? I mean, when we examine the English-speaking people that we take to be educated, there is a very high correlation between their having read Shakespeare and being highly educated. But correlation is not causation. I propose the alternative explanation that what makes something like Shakespeare's works educational is not any objective quality or feature of the works in themselves. Rather, education arises out of some combination of the quality and quantity of attention invested in an experience of that content by the learning agent. So when kids turn their attention to Shakespeare, if they merely skim over it and move on as quickly as possible, then there was little educational value in the experience. Most kids encountering the Old English as part of a school assignment will just skip right to the cliff notes in an attempt to pass the test and avoid as much actual reading of it as possible. They invest their attention in gaming the system, not learning the content. The fact that they can and do game their schooling in this way reinforces my point about the learning paradox in the first episode of this series. The kids are learning something from the experience, but it's not the lesson the teacher wrote down in the lesson plan. Instead of allowing Shakespeare to remain a lesson in how to game the system, we can take two steps to make it a more legitimately educational experience. The first step is enabling the learning agent to have their inbuilt reality simulator activated by the words of the bard. The second step is to explore the world created by the bard's words, such that the learning agent gains insights into his or her own world based on how Shakespeare portrayed his. These two steps are necessary for making any experience more authentically educational. That is one, activate the learning agent's reality simulator, then two, allowing the learning agent's simulator to run simulations based on the learner's experience of the content. This is why direct experiential learning is the most effective educational method. Immersion in the activity itself, as it occurs in the real world, is the most reliable way to activate reality simulators and enable learning agents to test the accuracy of their simulations. To see how Shakespeare's work has been used in this way in school all the way down to kindergarten, I recommend the documentary film A Touch of Greatness about the teaching practice of Albert Cullum. I suspect that the high correlation between highly educated individuals and their having read Shakespeare is mostly a coincidence. Shakespeare's works did not make them educated. What made them educated was, in the more likely scenario, being in a community that facilitated attentional investments of better quality and or greater quantity in their experiences. Or in a less likely scenario, simply having the gumption and luck to make the right attentional investment choices on their own. Now, this way of thinking about education will make standards-based instruction more effective by providing a crucial prerequisite to engaging learners in the pursuit of standards. Standards can be a wonderful tool, but only for those who have committed themselves to achieving those standards. I want Joe the plumber, who is fixing my toilet, my brain surgeon, and the teenager flipping my burger to all meet minimum objective standards of competency to ensure my health and safety. But in the absence of their individual personal commitment to achieving objective competence, then the standards cannot be consistently effective. 
Putting attitude before academics is all about ensuring that the people who show up are fully committed to becoming competent. Anything less than a full commitment is a waste of everyone's time and energy because what makes their experience educational is not any objective property of merely experiencing the content. What does make their experience of the content educational is the quality and quantity of attention they invest in that experience. Thanks for watching.